uh, FGB says that neuroscience has refuted dualism. And the reasoning he offers essentially goes like this. Why would a lack of neurotransmitters in the brain cause depression? If the soul is independent from the physical body, then why does this happen? He asks, why can we measure the movement of neurons in the brain if the soul is immaterial? And so he says that the soul is not reconcilable with neuroscience. Now, a lot can be said here. I actually don't think neuroscience refutes dualism. In fact, in many ways, I think it actually supports it. And let me give you a rough analogy, very rough analogy. Picture a car and then a person locked into that car with no way to get out. Okay, this person is independent of that car. If a tire on that car becomes flat, or if the steering wheel only turns one direction, the car isn't going to function properly, regardless of the person inside the car. If the turn signal only flashes one way, or if the gas and brake pedals are too sensitive, the car is not going to function properly, regardless of the person inside the car. Now, does this mean that the person is the car? No, and in given dualism, a person may be more prone to depression or not be able to do math or speak coherently given particular damage to the brain. But that simply shows a correlation between brain states and mental states, between physical states and behavioral states. What follows from this is that the brain can cause things to happen to the mind. That's it. Something the dualist can easily accept. What science knew was that the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body and vice versa and certain functions like speech came from one side only. Split brain patients or commissurotomy patients. These are people whose corpus callosum has been cut and anterior commissure and massa intermedia whenever encountered. So essentially you're taking, a, you're doing a karate chop right through the head and creating two human beings in one body, in one skull. Two spheres of consciousness. We set up an experiment where uh, we had the left hemisphere doing a task and simultaneously we had the right hemisphere doing a task. And what that means is the left hemisphere can talk to you about the one it's doing because that's where the language system is. But the right hemisphere doesn't talk, but yet it can process the information and carry out an activity. So you can get the right hemisphere left hand to point to objects and pick things up. And really the left hemisphere doesn't know why it's doing it. What about their personalities? Do they have different personalities? What about their aesthetic preferences? Does one like blondes and the other like brunettes, for example? One like chocolate and the other like vanilla? What, what happens? Because the information has been isolated in this right disconnected hemisphere because of the surgery. In other words, the problem for the split brain patient was that although the hemisphere that talks, the left hemisphere, can see what the right is doing, it doesn't know why. So we tried these experiments, and what we did was we had to first train the right hemisphere to communicate with us. In fact, the right hemisphere can read simple commands, simple words, simple sentences. And then you ask a question and say, point to a box, yes, no, I don't know. Because it can't talk, the right hemisphere can't talk. But it can comprehend simple semantics, simple questions. Left hemisphere, of course, can talk. So you can present boxes, yes, no, I don't know. The classic test was we showed a, a picture of a chicken uh, to the right visual field, left hemisphere, and the subject could choose one of four choices, one of which was a, a picture of a chicken claw that was most related to the chicken. And to the right hemisphere, we showed a picture of a snow scene. And there was a four objects for the, the right hemisphere left hand to choose, one of which was a shovel, which was the most related thing, a snow shovel. So we show these pictures. And uh, the first case we ran this on, case PS, immediately points to the chicken claw and to the shovel. And uh, we said, Paul, why, why are you doing that? What the patient replied led Gazaniga not only to come up with an explanation of the self, but also to say where the self was located. And he looks up and he goes, oh, well, he says, uh, the chicken claw goes with the chicken, and then he's looking down at his left hand, pointing at the shovel, and the left hemisphere is sort of watching this activity go on and cooks up a theory to be consistent with the actual behavior, and he goes, then you need a shovel to clean out the chicken shed. So he immediately generates a theory to explain a behavior that makes it consistent with the overall cognitive set that he has. So then you get this idea, well, he's interpreting his own behaviors, his overt behaviors, to be consistent with a storyline. And we finally realize that there is this something unique in the left hemisphere with respect to this, these cognitive activities. It's constantly trying to seek patterns, seek understanding towards our actual behavior felt states and all the rest. It's trying to tell a story. 
that's consistent with what's going on. And that becomes the narrative. That becomes the self-story of who we are and what we're doing and how we're interacting throughout life. So we asked, for example, are you at Caltech? And the right hemisphere pointed to yes. Are you on the moon? It said no. Are you asleep? It said no. Then I said, are you a woman? And the patient was male. And he pointed to yes, and then started chuckling and laughing. So at least the right hemisphere has a sense of humor. <laughs> okay, so now comes the big question. What if you ask, do you believe in God? So I said, do you believe in God? And the right hemisphere went straight to yes. Right? I asked the same question to the left hemisphere. Yes, no, I don't know. It went to no. Right? So here's a human being whose right hemisphere is an atheist. And left hemisphere, on the other hand, believes in God. And this finding should have sent a tsunami through the theological community but barely produced a ripple because it raises all kinds of profound theological questions. If this person dies, what happens? Does one him? <laughs> Does one hemisphere go to heaven and the other go to hell? I don't know the answer to that. So that was the answer. Our feeling that there was a self inside our bodies was an illusion. It was just a sign that the interpretive capacity in the left hemisphere of our brain was working. I like to give a lecture entitled, The Left Hemisphere, Don't Leave Home Without It. It is the thinking, language-based, hypothesis-generating hemisphere. It is the one that does the heavy lifting for our cognitive life. If you think of it as a theory-generating hemisphere, how do A and B relate? That interpreter chip, that little wiring, is in our left hemisphere. And it doesn't seem to be in the right. Gazzaniga had solved the problem of the self as a ghost in the machine by replacing it with a mechanism, a bundle of neurons whose effect is to create just the impression of there being a ghost in the machine. Ultimately, they're circuits. That's the assumption of neuroscience. Science, bitches, it works.